is or why are you here today? Um, so uh, we are working on the Java cryptonomics and we have been working in setting publishing for quite some time. Uh, we designed and started the uh, journal for research cultures by looking into how um, specific cultures exist in research and how um, researchers are building their own culture of knowledge, how they actually interact with specific data, how truth actually gets into existence in these kind of communities. And this is very interesting if you look at the blockchain space and the crypto space, because there um, you have a lot of um, opinionate, opinionated data on um, also opinion-led uh, um, research happening, because most of the research is actually happening uh, on company levels. So there's not so many true, um, I would say, scientific um, uh, foundations that we have compared to any other scientific discipline. <coughs> and since crypto economics is not a, a, an existing discipline, so we have to, um, in, um, in, a, in a way, as researchers, um, look and define the, the, the field as such. Um, as we have it now, um, crypto economics is a very um, um, Ethereum-led uh, um, space, I would say, also invented and started a lot of these yeah, uh, yeah. matches we have today. But also there is like crypto economics beyond Ethereum, so we're trying to look at it with a bit of a yeah, chain agnostic perspective of crypto yeah, economics. Yeah. So um, for example also how can we um, criticize yeah, specific yeah, elements or specific yeah, incentivations yeah, yeah. which come through or yeah. that lie embedded in the system yeah. by redefining yeah. the system by looking at token yeah. economics and by possibly also questioning a few of these matters. Okay, that's huh? very interesting. However, um, that's very specific. Yeah, that's that's specific. Yeah, that's 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 specific. That's very specific. Yeah. 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 In the in the this model, however, is how blockchain and crypto economics can uh, be useful tools to uh, help the scientific publishing community in general. So, uh, not only crypto economics research. So, uh, which potentials do you see from the blockchain and other for uh, research in general? So, in general, we have the problem uh, in academic publishing that um, there's a lot of. Um, in a way, um, closed uh, communication, like closed uh, um, projects actually happening. So what we, in my opinion, have to uh, is the problem that a lot of research has to be paid for someone in the end, and through the um, um, possibility of the blockchain, we can actually take away this power from these traditional publishing institutions more to uh, kind of democratize and also democratize in a way um, scientific publication as such. Go to this, um, Kind of peer review elements or like has some true open access uh, aspects that are not existing. Um, if you look at the blog that the publishing is actually working with, so you have a few stakeholders that are controlling it. In the end, even if we look at open access issues, we will see problems of uh, governance, problems of, uh, for example, uh, only uh, institutional research being published if they are not going to to publish. There's a lot of um, um, interesting approaches to this. Not necessarily the only thing to watch the space, but allow um, disturbed or like distracted and, 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 and uh, popping on the surface through blockchain. There are so many different um, ways how we can actually now interact with data and make sure that um, data is persistent. So we can make sure, um, um, for example, here you can also this control or verify. So I think it's a huge potential for the technology for the blockchain. So we have to see and um, identify specific uh, Was das wieder toll sein eigenen? Ja. Ja. Sehr gut. Genau. Das Einzige, was halt leider nicht klappt, ist der Livestream. Okay. Ja. Aber ihr nehmt es doch so auf. Ja, das nehme ich auch. Ich hoffe, das ist dann in Ordnung. Und dann der Livestream halt. Ja, aber das ist eh nicht. Das ist eh nicht. Das ist eh nicht. Ja, aber der recordet das gleichzeitig nicht. Ja, super.
together with Sönke Bartling from Blockchain for Science, who has come from Berlin uh, to conduct this conference with us. This is the first in a series of conferences, in a, it's a twin conference, because uh, a lot of you or some of you will be continuing this trip to Zurich, and there will be a two-day conference yeah, in Zurich. Yeah. Zurich. So um, without further ado, I will be speaking a bit more later. Uh, Alfred Taudes, who is our director, uh, the scientific lead of uh, the Research Institute for Crypto Economics, wants to say a few words to you. Yeah, warm welcome from my side. Welcome at this nice campus. I hope you enjoy your time. At least we have very nice weather. Uh, if anybody of you is interested in a special tour of the campus, please contact me. Uh, there should be, should be some break or so if you, if you want to also see some hidden spots here. We have some, uh, I tell you, just to, to make you curious. I hope we will have uh, a very good time. And uh, I think we are on a very important mission. Uh, and I'm glad that you all came because, uh, in simple words, our current scientific publishing system is fucked up. <laughs> <laughs> and, uh, I'm glad that uh, I also have number of people who also think that this needs some change. And change usually is not a thing of big crowd. It starts by some motivated people, and I'm very glad that these motivated people are here. So let's have a good time. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Just say a few words, so I'm very happy that you are all here. And the way we designed it's an unconference, so <laughs> Uh, as the blockchain world lives from participation and peer-to-peer -peer things, we hope after getting used to each other, we will like open up and uh, discuss stuff. And at any time, if you, I would say like, if you would like to like bring up a topic or discuss a topic, I think you can just speak up. Or if you want to introduce uh, some stuff later on, it's first structured and then it becomes more unstructured. And I mean, and then hopefully more structured again, okay? And uh, housekeeping-wise, I think you all have Wi-Fi working, yeah? The live stream is not working. We are recording and taking pictures. If anybody of you is not okay with it, let me know. And um, I think that's all, yeah? Best for the presentations is to use the drop-off links on the, on the web page. And uh, that's all from my side. And we start with... Yes. Oh, so uh, we would very much, thank you, uh, we would very much like to welcome uh, Professor Pichler here, who is uh, not only the Pizza Director of the Forschung, but uh, him and his team um, are also part of the Research Institute for Crypto Economics, so please welcome him. Yeah, 
yeah, good morning uh, to everybody. Um, on behalf of the Rector of uh, the U, we have the honor to welcome all of you to this uh, unconference on scientific publishing on the blockchain. And honestly, I have to Google the word unconference. Uh, professor of, of banking and finance, and not so much in these uh, blockchain and new technology things. So learn what uh, an unconference is, and I uh, think it's a good idea to have it in this uh, more unstructured and an open way. And, and then I, I, I recognized that uh, uh, I have to provide an opening keynote. So I thought it's a public keynote or a private keynote. <laughs> <laughs> I'm not sure, but I can promise you that uh, the, what, whatever note I will give is a more unstructured one and I try to, let's say, summarize my thoughts uh, as a professor of finance with, with a, let's say, loose link to, to, to blockchain uh, technology and uh, as a vice director of research uh, of, 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 of a university. Um, yeah, so first of all, I think that uh, that's clear, all of you are here because of that, that uh, this is a very promising uh, field of, of, of research. Uh, I think blockchain and, and, and crypto economics in, in, in general is, is for sure one of the fastest growing, but maybe also one of the most rapidly changing fields in research in, in economics and business in, in, in a broad sense. And it will be for the forthcoming years at, at least. But I also think that to grow fast and to be exposed to rapid changes is clearly also a challenge. But uh, this makes uh, this specific research field also extremely interesting. And second, uh, this um, specific topic has first a huge potential to influence the way how research is organized from an institutional perspective. So we it's an interesting feedback loop. It's a, let's say, like a regular uh, conference on a research topic, but the contents of the research itself has a huge potential to influence the, 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 the way of how we're doing uh, research in the, in the future. And I can also uh, talk a little bit uh, from my perspective as a vice director for research. Because in this function, I'm responsible for the library and the, and the library the services of this university. And this, it is one of the very special duties, at least once a year, I, I, I get a, a, a staple of, 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 of forms where I have to sign the money transfers to the big publishing houses like Elsie, uh, Springer, uh, you know it. And it's always a big money. Yes. Yeah, there's some cranks in the heart, but in, 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 in essence, what, what I feel that, um, and we will have a talk about that in, in the afternoon, that we are in a very, very unpleasant strategic situation in universities vis-a-vis -vis, um, the publishing firms. And, and, and I try to look at it as an economic game with, yeah, a very a bad strategic uh, situation, at least currently. And why? And in a nutshell, the situation is, is the following. So the research content is, of course, produced by researchers, as, as, as we are, and we are paid by our universities usually. The quality control of the production process, process so that the review is done by researchers who are paid by universities. So the, having this um, uh, production uh, exercise as an example, the raw material and the refinement effort is provided by the universities. And finally, the universities are paying millions of billions yeah, to buy the final products, which are more or less produced by themselves. So one may ask why this can happen. And obviously, there is a, let's say, first part of the answer, that is that the publishers are offering a technology for the processing of submissions, processing of, 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 
of reviews and also for the final publication. This, this is one element. The other element is that the big publishing houses have uh, built a big, uh, big reputational value for their respective journals. And given the current technology, this building of reputation can only sustain in an oligopolistic structure in equilibrium. And a little bit, I will a little bit explain that, what I mean. So there are entrance barriers right, for outsiders uh, uh, into this market, and these entrance barriers seem to be extremely high. And, and I think many open access journal initiatives have experienced that. Uh, that the publishing, yeah, the technology to publish something on the internet is the less tricky part. It's the reputation part, uh, which is the essential one. So the key element, I think, in, in this unpleasant strategic situation of universities is the combination of the reputational value uh, that publishing houses have created and uh, the technology that they are providing. And the processing technology that they are providing is a centralized one. So, the reputation of the publishers combined with the centralized processing technology because of the trust. Yeah, nobody would submit the journal to a reviewing process which is not trusted. And nobody would publish uh, a paper out of a reviewing process uh, that is not uh, trustable. So this technology combined with the effort to build reputation is obviously sufficiently costly. Yeah? And this uh, creates the entrance area and this uh, creates this oligopoly. So from my personal point of view, a decentralized ledger technology as blockchain has definitely the potential uh, to make the use of this centralized technology no longer necessary. So, if blockchain works, yeah, and has uh, the, te the technology to, to replace the centralized uh, uh, technology of the publishers, then the entrance cost yeah, would dramatically decrease. And this will lead to a fundamental change of the payoffs in this matrix yeah, of, of this economic game between the publishers and the universities. And this is clearly a thing that could be disruptive. If you have an equilibrium based on an economic game and the game is determined by the payoffs in the payoff matrix and you change yeah, the payoffs dramatically, you will have different equilibrium. So this is maybe the historical uh, chance um, to have a transition from one system uh, uh, to, to the other. And I think, yeah, uh, maybe some of the presentations uh, during this day will uh, dig deeper into this question. I think, of course, it's a question of whether technology works, whether the new technology is trustable or sufficiently trustable to, to replace uh, the centralized solutions. And uh, I think, Given the situation that at least in Europe um, there is a lot of new negotiations with the big publishing houses, there is a political uh, support by the European Union to get a little bit more independence from the publishing houses as, as a university system. Maybe this is a once in a lifetime chance to uh, participate in a, in a, in a, in a new and, and maybe very promising development. So to come to an end, I wish all of us uh, many interesting and stimulating presentations, many fruitful dis discussions, and maybe despite, of course, of the tight uh, conference schedule, some relaxing hours here at the campus and in Vienna. So thank you very much. state of crypto economic research in general and um, parts of this state of the research will be um, relevant to 
um, this conference uh, today. And I'm very happy, Christian, that is nice. Uh, to see someone from Ethereum here uh, today in Vienna. Uh, I think we're on the right track. Crypto economics really is a very mm, or relatively new scientific field of research. And um, as most people, uh, people who don't come from a computer um, science or uh, engineering uh, background, they would think it's a new line of economics. It really isn't. And um, yes. um, so before we talk about the state of crypto economics research, we need to know what is crypto economics. And does that work? So crypto Same economics way. is not when really a subfield of economics. When you put that presentation up, in another tab, open this side. At least traditionally it comes yeah, out of applied that. cryptography okay. that takes into account economic incentives um, and uh, economic theory. So traditionally, uh, crypto economics has been in the computer science departments, or very specialized computer science departments. Um, and um, uh, economists have less worked on that field, even though uh, there have been conferences and places where this theory has uh, merged a little bit. And if we look at Bitcoin, Ethereum, and everything that followed, um, they're really products of crypto economics. It's applied crypto economics. However, that science is uh, quite a new one. Um, it's very important to understand, and I think everyone here in the room probably, or most people here already understand that Bitcoin is not a currency, but it is this crypto economic operating system for a new type of economy. And at the same time, it's a payment settlement layer, and at the same time, the token as itself is a new type of asset class. And this new crypto economic operating system allows us to move from a world that is organized like this, top down, with um, organizations that have one legal entity and where the agents within these organizations or stakeholders are organized by legal contracts. Um, crypto economics allows a distributed uh, autonomous stakeholders that are distributed globally uh, in various jurisdictions uh, allows uh, these uh, autonomous stakeholders to work as a distributed network. There is no centralized legal entity. There is no employment or delivery contract or whatever contract in any way, shape or form. The only contract there is is in the protocol which is transparent and auto-enforceable if and when the conditions are met. Um, and crypto economics is a combination of cryptography, peer-to-peer -peer ne network theory, peer-to-peer -peer networks, and game theory. And it's important because crypto economics has to make sure that a distributed network of actors that do not know and trust each other can interact in a way um, that uh, is truthful and where the network is, uh, where it's really, really, really expensive or almost impossible to attack the network. So last summer, this is just um, some old, old numbers from last summer, uh, it costs around, in order to conduct a 51% attack on Bitcoin, it would have cost you 1.8 billion in hardware and 3.4 million in electricity per day to be able to attack that network. And so, yes, it is um, um, possible to manipulate the network uh, that is run without a centralized entity, uh, but it's really expensive, and that is the result of crypto economics. So, I'm, I'm, uh, I'm, 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 I'm telling the story in a very condensed way because most of us already know it. So after Bitcoin, we had Ethereum, and Ethereum allowed us to all of a sudden create our own um, kind of currencies or tokens and crypto economic networks on top, like application networks, uh, decentralized networks with the application to with token on top of Ethereum. And last year alone, um, well, that's, um, we had 4 billion in more or less um, um, uh, 4, four $4 billion uh, uh, in, in, in worth of cryptocurrencies that were raised uh, for ICOs. 
the problem is that the crypto economics of native blockchain tokens, and we will get into that a bit later, uh, is well defined. Proof of work behind Bitcoin, Ethereum, and many other chains, and we're now moving into alternative crypto economic systems or consensus protocols. The problem is that on an application token level, for usage, utility tokens, etc., um, where it's not an asset tech token, the design functions are not really defined yet. And we've had $4 billion raised for tokens last year, most of which, uh, or a lot of which, are application tokens with really lousy mechanism design because nobody knows what they're doing. And that might backfire uh, quite soon. Uh, so what is classic crypto economics research? Um, as we're speaking, these words and uh, terms are being defined. Um, so from how I see it, uh, you could classify three types of research areas um, on a very high level. One is uh, consensus protocols of native blockchain tokens, um, proof of work, proof of stake, and uh, everything else that is uh, following right now. Um, on the other hand, you have um, token engineering of application tokens, and this is now becoming a thing. We are seeing more and more people discussing online uh, about mechanism design of application tokens that are um, um, attack resistant because most of them have no mechanism design, as I said. Most of the tokens that have been issued for ICOs were probably a pretense just to conduct an ICO, but they don't really have a meaningful mechanism design behind them. Um, and, or very often, um, people mistake uh, putting uh, old world assets, representing them in a token, and putting, like kind of shifting the token from A to B, but there is no automated uh, mechanism behind many of these tokens that really allows us to to um, interact in a distributed way. Uh, that's very abstract, so let's, let's look at, uh, at an example that would be relevant for what we're doing here. If in the scientific publishing process, we want to move away from peer-to-peer -peer publishing to swarm review, uh, where we don't have centralized entities with two peer reviewers um, control, um, like um, uh, uh, quality controlling our, our academic research. And if we would like to decentralize this more, we would need some decentralized reputation systems. But we need to design these decentralized reputation systems in a way that they're non-manipulative, that they're attack resistant. And that is very much dependent on um, mechanism design. And this is a new field of research for on an application layer. And this, 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 the third research area is probably somewhere in between this and this. I see it as a kind of middleware. Um, anything kind of the design of state channels, for example, um, that allow us to solve some, for example, scalability issues of uh, the underlying blockchain protocols. They also need to be uh, designed, uh, have, have, have a crypto economic design behind them, so that is a field of research. Um, this is all very high level, so if I had an hour, we could go more in detail. But if we look at crypto or economics as a new kind of, uh, or relative, relatively new science that is now being extended into non-traditional fields, you have traditional cryptography, which is a line of research, if, uh, and there is a lot happening there. Um, State-of-the-art blockchains are based on a certain type of cryptography, but newer blockchains are using different types of cryptography that are uh, allowing us to have, for example, more anonymous transactions or choose whether we want to have more anonymous transactions, like uh, multi-party computation, zero-knowledge proofs, etc. On the other hand, we have the field of economics, um, our economic incentives that interacts with this, so uh, we're moving slowly, possibly moving away from proof of work uh, to alternative consensus mechanisms, proof of stake, etc. But these alternative consensus mechanisms haven't been tested yet in many cases, um, 
and um, we're all very much looking forward to how the Casper transition will happen in Ethereum. On the other hand, one big line of research is anything related to governance. Because today we talk about crypto economics, because it's the economics incentive that allow us to have this distributed network of actors um, kind of auto-enforce rules in an attack-resistant way. But in the end, a blockchain or similar systems are governance tools uh, that allow us to have automated governance or more agile forms of governance or more distributed, geographically distributed forms of governance. Therefore, we have this whole area of research that um, that touches anything from legal aspects, government aspects, public policy aspects. And uh, there is a lot of knowledge out there because we're not really reinventing the wheel. Blockchain and crypto economics is a kind of new technology, but we have to merge the know-how of regulatory governance, uh, legal public policy environments and merge this with the knowledge of creating these new systems. So. We don't have problems that, for example, a lot of blockchains are having right now around like uh, hard fork discussions and um, who decides over a um, code upgrade. Um, so is it rule of code or do we have governance, uh, off-chain governance tools? And if yes, how do we want to design them? So here we need to work together with public policy and uh, legal experts because there is a lot of know-how. And then on the application layer, it's just a word here, but really uh, blockchain applications or uh, decentralized applications will have a very different logic to them than uh, centralized applications we know today for two main reasons, because we're reinventing the data structure. Data is public to everyone in the future in the decentralized web. That means that one single entity cannot monopolize data. Hopefully we will have more privacy through multi-party computation, zero-knowledge proof uh, kind of solutions while being able to conduct um, complex applications that use AI. Um, but at the same time, the second part obviously is that auto-enforceable smart contracts reduce tra British, um, transaction costs and get rid of the middleman and we have more transparency. So the field of research that stems from here uh, is uh, very big. And um, I think in 2018, 2017 was probably the year of the ICOs. 2018 might be the year where we'll see more tokenizing real assets on one hand, uh, governments or companies uh, tokenizing uh, assets of the real world and moving into that space. Um, but I think that 2018 might also be the year where we talk much more about mechanism design, token engineering, what is a token, and how do I uh, design a system that's truly distributed, and we have too little know-how, and we need to, uh, on an applied level and on a research level, talk much more about it. This is why we created the Forschungs Institute for Crypto Economy, the, our crypto economics lab here at the Vienna University of Economics. We started the beginning of this year and uh, we have already 30 researchers from various disciplines. Um, I couldn't put it all in a, in a slide, so you only have the headlines. From, uh, oh, that's the German screenshot now. So we have from the computer science departments researchers, from the legal departments researchers, uh, we have um, from our economics departments, finance department, but also from the business departments, researchers, all trying to wrap their head around the implications and also the core research that needs to be conducted. And one of the biggest problems that we're fa facing now is that all these different researchers coming from different fields all have their own set of vocabulary. And <laughs> most of the time we spend, like when a legal scholar talks about a contract, uh, they mean a very different thing than when a computer scientist talks about a contract or a smart contract. So definitions is a big challenge. Um, but I think one of the second big challenge is also that on an application level, we have a lot of researchers that already understand that this is disruption. But our greatest challenge is to make the cryptographers and the computer scientists work together with the economists and the econometricians. 
because most economists and econometricians do not understand that their know-how is very useful for mechanism design and token engineering. And, um, and so I think we will need some time to get everyone up to speed and hopefully truly really work, uh, create this great body of work. And uh, I'm doing this together with Alfred Taudis. And I hope that next time, this year, we will be able to present more. Currently, we're working on the idea is to have a research map of research questions. Our greatest challenge is to define the research questions um, that uh, are relevant in the diff different fields. So if you want to know what we're doing and stay up to date, follow us uh, on social media. And other than that, I hope that this will be a very fruitful and we will have a second conference next year and I'll hand over to the next speaker. Is there a question? Oh yeah, is there uh, any questions? Sorry. <laughs> it's an unconference. <laughs> so, um, yeah, so today will be more the uh, the talk part and tomorrow will probably be the more, a little bit more, uh, uh, definitely more interactive parts, but if there are any questions. Yeah. Quick one. Are you aware of other things going on around the world, like you building up the department here uh, to Vienna, is there something else going on somewhere? Well, um, we've really researched it in that extent uh, and in that size, I believe we are the first. But there have, like uh, many universities world, worldwide, have some kind of blockchain lab or crypto lab. It's usually one dimensional. It's a business center, for example, in Frankfurt. There is, however, a small interdisciplinary institution in, uh, at RMIT in Melbourne. They've been doing, conducting, they have legal scholars uh, that have been working with econom uh, economists, but there are like four or five people. I think in the size and in the scope, uh, um, 30 researchers, interdisciplinary, we're the first. And maybe what I didn't say, but some of you know, is Alfred Taudes has been the initiator of the Austrian Blockchain Center uh, that we just submitted for, which will be a, um, a research cluster. Uh, Riot will be part of it too, like a lot of independent uh, and, and, and institutional research institutions in Austria will be working together in an even more interdisciplinary fashion we have um, and uh, if we get the funding which we will know end of the year uh, we will have a full-fledged research cluster out of Austria and I think we are in that sense really the first um, I didn't notice but do you have um, anthropologists involved in no, unfortunately not yet. We would like to, so we only just started. Um, we would like to, we're, I, the VU in itself is a business and economics university, but it, because of its size, it has many different departments. Um, I think what we still lack are the social science departments. I, would, uh, I think we can learn a lot from biology, biomimicry, anthropology, obviously. Uh, we would like to uh, start collaborating with the complexity hub. Uh, they are here because this is super complexity science and I think what we also need to understand is that probably AI is a huge, there is a huge interrelation between machine learning, AI and blockchain um, and um, yes, it will be a step by step process so ideally we want to do it more interdisciplinary than now. The greatest challenge right now is that Blockchain has been a technology that has been driven by the industry, by, by the real world, let's say. Um, it has built on a body of work uh, of cryptography, peer-to-peer -peer networks, and, 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 and um, uh, game theory of decades of academic research, but it was really driven um, out of uh, the real world. And what I find here is that academia, is there is this huge time lag, they don't know what's going on and they are slowly reading up. Some of, it's, it's not true for everyone, but even in the computer science departments, not everyone was up to speed. Um, yes. So we will need a bit more time. But then I think we can leverage the potential of academic researchers, they have a lot of time. And their aim is to research for the sake of research. And right now, um, these are very research intense technologies. So if we, 
are able to bridge that gap, uh, I think it will be very fruitful. Um, so economics is strongly tied to money, and you, just, you mentioned the European system's asset classes, but for knowledge and science, we've got a far broader currency perspective. And what, what we mean by reputation, um, is it truthful? So I was wondering if your research was going to expand beyond the monetary paradigm of economics. Uh, yes, hopefully, but can you, so reputation systems, as you said, is a very, very important uh, aspect. Uh, so really, the the research that we're conducting here, uh, my my role is uh, together with Alfred Taudes is to coordinate the research of these researchers. All of these 30 researchers are not working for us. They're, they're independent researchers, the head of institutes, like for example, Stefan Pichler um, or Hannelore. Are you um, she's still here? Yeah. Hannelore was also working with Stefan Pichler. There are independent researchers who have their own, they're working at their own um, institutes here, but we're trying to coordinate the research efforts. Um, and to be this point of uh, where, where, where some interdisciplinary conversation and dialogue can happen. So uh, we cannot tell the researchers what to research, we can rather inspire them and provide a platform for idea exchange within the institutions but also with the outside world. Um, so I'm happy for any type of input on how to improve this and there is a lot of know-how we don't have at the VU because we're not a social sciences university, unfortunately. I just say, you've done amazingly well to get 30 people on the University of Auckland, and it's like, no, this is not my area of research, you know, they refuse to engage. So it's great that you're doing, I mean, yes. we're from a big, I'm from a We were surprised yeah. ourselves. I think yeah. that when we started last summer to plan this research institute, we were like hand selecting who to invite. And then once it became, because it wasn't public yet, once it became public, they started to flood us, no? <laughs> yeah. But also, yeah. just one thing, it's a risk, because I know the people at RMIT, and they try to get other people involved, but they're saying there's nowhere to publish, because it's interdisciplinary, so... Yeah. Okay, um, maybe the, the specific way the research institutes here, the interdisciplinary research institutes at the VU work, they're like a virtual institute. We got some base funding to, for me and a second person who will work for me for five years. Uh, but we're not, uh, as I said, a top-down institution. And I don't know what we did. Uh, I, but I think it's a very interesting field, so everybody knows it's a thing. Maybe I'm, I'm sure it was also a timing thing. Had we started a year earlier, we probably would have gotten much less interest from the researchers. It was, perfect timing, it was already out there in the media, so even maybe legal scholars who are not really into technology, new things, uh, realize that it is a thing. Um, and um, yes, timing. Yes. When you see funding coming from to run the, the outcome um, in the future? Uh, we are seeing a lot of interest from, from uh, companies they are trying to wrap their head around uh, how they can apply it. Unfortunately, companies are on an application level. However, a lot of, for this research cluster, we got a lot of letter of intents from many uh, crypto startups also, because they're, for example, the Ocean Protocol or the Gnosis people, they're designing their own token, but they don't know what the mechanism design should be, so they have a lot of interest to work together with econometricians here. The problem is that they have money post-ICO, the only problem is that there is time lag still, so we're trying to uh, bridge this gap. You know, there, there is a lot of money coming from the industry. Uh, I don't know, we just, uh, I don't, it's not official yet. It's, uh, it's very likely, but not finalized. We might get, my, my personal research area is blockchain and sustainability, how to incentivize a sustainable world, and we might get a 200k funding from the Austrian Development Agency. Mm -hmm. So I think it's, it's a thing now, people are giving money for those kind of things. Okay, maybe we should wrap it up because I'm over time, mm -hmm. and I, I'll be here the whole day. <laughs>
speak here. Yes, so it's been actually a long time that, since I've done a, a talk like this. I'm better at sort of Socratic dialogue and, and conferences. So um, thank you to Simki for inviting me to give maybe a historical perspective. So uh, my main crime um, yeah. is that I'm very old. Um, so uh, I thought rather than introduce myself, I'll introduce myself and what I do and my background in this through the, the, the slide. And uh, please, if anyone wants to interrupt me, um, I really don't like the sound of my own voice, so I prefer to answer questions. Okay. So this is where I started. Uh, I was a researcher, uh, immunologist at uh, UC, I did a degree in evolutionary genetics and immunology, and also a medical student at Charing Cross Hospital here. So I spent nine years doing medicine there. Um, I was coming up to my finals, I got my... I wanted to be a research immunologist. Uh, uh, but I was a, a troubled young man, and so I also you know, took four years out to do philosophy. And that's when I came across a strategic problem that what I was doing was illegal. You're not allowed to run your philosophy degree at UC at the same time as you're doing your medical degree. Um, and my finals were clashing, so I had to ask for another year out. And I came up with an idea to uh, do this interdisciplinary student note-taking system for medical students. So the, a way of attaching uh, your patient histories to the subjects we were taught in all these different departments. And so this was in 1989. Um, and because it was going to be difficult for me to take a year out, I had to get like really good references and stuff. So I went to uh, Imperial College and I went, talked to the computer department there. And they showed me a couple of papers in this very early system, hypertext system. And that's when I, I read, like, uh, Van Vaar Bush's um, As We May Think, and uh, the foundation, and if anyone hasn't read that paper, that was 1945, his description of what science should be and how knowledge should be shared is completely seminal. Um, and it was a real paper. In other words, it was in a newspaper rather than an academic. Um, and uh, that's what I decided I wanted to do. So I got, first of all, the sabbatical, and then I founded this multimedia all three centre, which was actually my first attempt at marketing. So um, Mac, you see, I wanted sponsorship from Apple. Um, uh, any case, um, uh, the, the, by the way, this isn't what the hospital uh, looked like. This is what it looked like. I couldn't find a good picture of this hospital. And this hospital, the most interesting thing about this hospital is its architecture. So it's called Charing Cross, and the architects designed this hospital as a cross, like uh, this is a cross if you look at it vertically, uh, with all the patients uh, in these rooms here overlooking the graveyard. <laughs> so um, this is a metaphor for me about um, complex systems design and architecture. The architect was concentrating on something. His job should have been to think about this. The, the, the researchers were in this building, the hospitals, but they didn't look at the systemic effects of what that felt like as a patient in these rooms, sick in a bed, overlooking a graveyard. Right? Um, any case, uh, during this period, I basically created a, um, a wiki in 1990. Um, this was not online then, it was a, a desktop application. Um, and it was linked to, I, Students and myself, we created about 14,000 pages on this wiki, and we linked. Uh, uh, it was a, a really beautiful system where, uh, as you were typing your notes, you would just highlight um, a phrase, a drug, a term you didn't understand, click enter, and then you could create a dictionary page, and that would link to all the other um, similar pages in other disciplines. And it was linked to 100,000 images. At that time, it was a laser disk. So as soon as you went to that page, it would look up the database, and in a separate monitor, you would have this. Um, the problem I had um, in this time, because I had, the dean gave me a, 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 you know, a department, a virtual equipment, it was a physical department in a, I don't know where it was, but it was in a beautiful room. And uh, but we had no funding. It was at the time of Europe, UK being the poor man of Europe and Margaret Thatcher and funding being withdrawn from the universities and so forth in London, particularly to go to the regions. But I had to try and get funding from publishers and from companies. And the main academic criticism I had is when the professors came to the, um, the uh, research department and I showed them all this kind of whizzy stuff, because I had equipment from Philips and Apple and all this sort of stuff, um, was they said, yeah, but it's kind of students who made this. How do we know that we can safely pass on this information 
to other people? How can we test it? So I started to think about that, and I developed <laughs> basically two things uh, into that software. Uh, one was basically um, a, a, a page rank algorithm. It was basically, I wanted to say, you as a student endorse this page, and someone else endorses you, so I can assign a reputation of quality to this particular thing. And I was very much looking at, with publishers, how we could publish this information. So the second thing I added to it was something called publishing points. So I wanted to be able to pay the multiple contributions of all these authors. So bear in mind this is 1991, round about then. Okay. Um, uh, what are the lessons I learned from this uh, experiment? First of all, don't believe lawyers. That's really, really important. I love law, by the way. I'll, I'll tell you about that later. <coughs> but, uh, when I started to, to talk about the publishing points, the lawyers say, no, that's illegal can't do a currency. Only governments can do that. Please stop. Which I did for about five years. Um, the, the politics of the institution was really important as well. The nature of the technology is interdisciplinary and you know it's fantastic that you've got this interdisciplinary department together. But that is so hard to do because of all the structural incentives built into the departments. Departments would not collaborate and I made a fundamental mistake in my career of instead of choosing the best department and putting myself underneath it, I said, I'll just bring these departments together. And so I had no, no sponsor, no support in that sort of sense. Right? And the other lesson is some things take a very long time. Um, oh, this is a bit of a cut. I'll actually go here. So um, I have submitted two papers to an MIT and um, uh, Trinity Col College Dublin conference. One was on this peer review system that I was really passionate about, and the other was about object-oriented theatre and VR and uh, high-end graphics, because the companies were approaching us to show us off. And they accepted this paper as a keynote and not the, the academic one, which I was really interested in. I think they wanted the flash video projector, that was the main thing. They wanted kind of a whizzy thing at their conference, right? And then I got... Um, lots of people wanting to invest, and, and I've been working for three years without money um, uh, in, in science, basically. And these people gave me an office, and uh, we started to basically take shows and do art and interactive performances. That's how I saw the, the educational platform that we should build. There was a teacher fielding questions with a projection and pointing at things, and, and that's very much like what we could do with, uh, in a performance uh, a space of that. Um, but I'm not going to go too much into that. The, the reasons I'm bringing this stuff, and out of that came the next time that I looked at reputation, really, which was I started something with, together with two other people, Michael Nordfors in Sweden, and um, uh, Psyche, uh, John Donison in America, uh, called, called Liquid Democracy. In, an, in about, for me, this was 2002, um, I think we basically worked on it. Um, the three of us came together in Vienna, in Berlin, in Sweden. I can't remember the dates too much. Around about 2003 to 2006. And liquid democracy is basically, although it's been taken up in specific ways, is basically the science, for me at least, it's the science of reputation fields and how you can use them to uh, add value to the collective decision making. Whether that be electing an MP or a scientific post or a peer review panel or a particular invention. And the reason I called it liquid democracy is because I've, I've now been funded in art because no one else would fund me. Um, and uh, I started this thing called the multi, well, it's a commission that's only into person, multicultural yoga. I did more science in this project than I did in medicine, by the way. It, we, we were studying how you could create multicultural yogurts from the different um, bacteria strains and see whether they could co inhabit peacefully in one yogurt strain. And, and, and we created this political party and this uh, uh, company to manufacture multicultural yoga. And I had to figure out what the political system for that party was. So I called it liquid democracy, taking this reputation metrics from the science stuff. Um, so revisiting liquid democracy, I did. I, I left liquid democracy around 2006 to 9 because I was, became very aware, and this is a current issue to do with blockchain. Um, and it probably will be for another couple of years, I reckon, um, uh, is that it's very much individuals in uh, an anonymous protocol or, 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 or 
you know, it's, I call it kind of Uber for science or something like this, you know, or Uber for, for individuals working within a network. And the core thing, and now there's been some interesting papers that illustrate this as well, is real collective intelligence comes out of small group work, which is then networked. So the missing thing in liquid democracy for me was what, how do we create these small group work? So I started to work on this thing called liquid law, uh, which is a domain specific legal language, which you could uh, constitute these groups and give them real, uh, uh, real robustness. And then worked on several science projects. SciMatch was one for EPSRC project, um, interdisciplinary again, trying to look at how companies and uh, research departments could share knowledge, and that was difficult. Um, uh, interestingly, because I found it easier in art and in computer science to share knowledge, and when I came back to science, it was so competitive and so difficult, the researchers were refusing to share their current knowledge at conferences. And I found that is really interesting. If science is worse at sharing knowledge than artists, that's saying same something. Um, I got involved in Ethereum in 2000, December 2013 and through 2014, uh, because as soon as I heard that you could do interesting things with the kind of programmatic space in blockchain, uh, in, 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 in Bitcoin, um, when Ethereum came up, I thought that's the language that we can create these governance structures, these uh, reputation systems and so forth. And uh, a lot of money's going to be invested in that, and that enables us to do things at scale that aren't to do with money, but are to do with all sorts of other values. Um, and I've been working with Ward Cunningham, who's the inventor of PostWiki, um, on this writing platform, which is very much about how if I write, it's basically a micro-publishing platform without the blockchain. So if I write a small uh, page, uh, you can fork it, and then you can customize it, make it yourself, and then someone else can fork it on their server, and these ideas start flowing through a network of servers, carrying the provenance and the history of every single change, edit, and authorship as it goes. But it's not robust, it's just in a Node.js project. So we've done two experiments with that, to do with the DAP protocol and to do with IPFS, and also to do with Holochain, which is a post-blockchain project. Um, over the last two years. Um, so, how much time have I got, by the way? Um, this is something that I started four or five years ago, um, which is basically looking at, in science, if you look sociologically and anthropologically at knowledge generation in science, everything is emphasized on novel um, uh, 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 research, new research. If you're not doing something new, you get no brownie points citation index stuff like that. And that aspect of uh, anthropologically, culturally uh, uh, speaking, of knowledge generation is probably only about 10 or 15% of the real value of knowledge creation. And another hugely important aspect is your ability as a thinker, as a researcher, to spot the quality of someone else's work. And it's very interesting that the sort of person who is very good at sort of forging ahead in a very dedicated piece of research and coming up with something novel is a completely different emotional and intellectual personality as someone who's very good with the group and saying, oh, that was really interesting what you said and what you said and we could put these things together. They're not the same mindset, they're not the same quality, but it is a complete, and that is basically what peer reviewers should be doing. So that area of how you incentivize and accredit that sort of skill is what made me this. That comes from Tipping Point, Malcolm Gladwell's idea of uh, a, a particular character who moves across different disciplines, understands and picks them up and synthesizes them into something new. And this is something that I'm particularly interested in working on this year. Um, oh yeah, we know about peer review stuff. Um, and this is what I would like, and this is one of the reasons I'm here, um, is, um, it feels like there is a possibility now of bringing these things together around an open science core. So there's lots of money, lots of startups, and a lot of the reason all this stuff didn't happen since 1945 onwards is because of the economic and social incentives of the institutions out there not finding any value in the interdisciplinary nature of research. Okay? So at this point of time, 
the marriage of universities, the finance that's out there in blockchain world and so forth, indicates that we could establish an open science protocol in the center in which, in which companies can come and benefit from, and yet the, the evolution of the, the process, the mechanism, and the incentives, and the knowledge that is published in science is done in a better way than it's ever been possible to do before. And it's only if we collaborate, rather than getting in our own departmental silos and saying, those guys are doing it before me, um, and we work out the governance of that collaboration, that we'll be able to do this. Um, so this is the core thing that I want to really go. I'm a, a new form of scientific journal. Other people are working on this, and I'm really hoping that I'll find some sort of collaboration on that. I want to work on micro-publications, very small, um, you know, publish early, publish often, but keep your accreditation. Semantic addressable, um, uh, content addressable links, things like IPFS, so that those links last 100 years, they don't get broken. This is just super obvious stuff. I mean, I, I, I mean I've known the IPFS guys since they've been wandering around the world in four or five years, and they're steadily, steadily working on this, and they're super smart, and it's hard work, and there are other ways of doing it, but they're just that's the sort of thing science should be doing, and everyone in science should know this. Immutable provenance, that means I need to be secure if I publish something that I just thought of in the last two year, days, I need to be secure if Matthias forks it and someone else forks it, that if in three years time my work is used, that there is a, a, a provable link to what I said, and I can use it on my CV, I can use it in other ways. And that's what blockchain is really good for. Um, data and simulations and bringing that in, you've got to also be aware of the things that are hitting the browser, you've got to be aware of WebAssembly, compiler tool chains, web components, standards based stuff, in order to think how can we bring data and how can we bring simulations, which is the core of complex science work, is arguing over a simulation. How can we bring that into the publishing process? Uh, so, yeah, making it robust. So, this, uh, I'm going to quickly do maybe show a couple of things. We're not hard set on this sort of stuff, but um, in case people don't know of the sort of tools that are coming out at the moment that are a bit left wing, this is a democracy.earth, um, Democracy Earth Foundation, been going a couple of years, Bill Mancini comes out of Democracy Earth. It's liquid democracy contracts on the Ethereum blockchain. So we're hoping to use this and marry it, not to democratic decision making, but science publishing. Um, this is super important, so this is self-sovereign identity. There are a bunch of projects in this area. Um, this should be linked to ORCID and similar sorts of things to give robust identity to people publishing, whether they be citizen sciences or academics. And getting that right is core to the tech. So we're looking at choosing this, uh, the best one that we can this year in this. And then these are the sort of things which I don't hear. There's probably lots of people in this room working on it, but in my travels, I don't hear too many people talking about it. So forking is a really interesting political and scientific concept. So in terms of collaborative writing, I've been now working. I, I've written hundreds of 30,000 odd pages in hypermedia landscapes with other people. And when you have a practice of how you write and research this, you start writing in a different way. And when, to be free and feel comfortable that someone takes an early stage idea, forks it, changes it into something you disagree with, is deeply uncomfortable for scientists or even business people. But if we can succeed in incentivizing that, we'll do a fundamental thing for human knowledge generation. So understanding what fork is and how we can use it in the publishing process is key. Argument maps are how you feed back. Argument maps are used in AI research, they're used in political science. Very little on it, as far as I can see. But getting the visualization, I've worked on it a lot to do with liquid democracy. Getting that feedback right and the soft incentives and the hard incentives of, of representing like someone's argument versus someone else's argument. Where do they meet? Where do they agree? Where do they disagree? How can I disagree with this particular point while I agree with the rest? And if this particular point changes, what happens to the overall shape of the argument of that individual, that discussion, or that small group? That's a core thing, getting the sociology, the interface design, and adding the maths behind it. 
uh, knowledge roles, different knowledge roles are important. We're not all the same, we don't all think the same. How do we put these different knowledge roles together and make sure they're all incentivized, not just one elite group that, as the gentleman said, is fucking up science for the last 50 years. Right? Um, algorithms and architecture. So algorithms, like when I was working on the liquid democracy um, algorithms at uh, Charing Cross Hospital in 1990, I didn't even know it was an algorithm. I mean, I must have worked through 20 different forms of process and code of how this reputation stuff worked. For me, it's just pragmatic. How do you, how do you organize a series of steps um, so that you get the desirable outcome and how do you implement that in code? Um, algorithm, though, is now almost like this priest-like term. If you've published an algorithm, you've done something amazing. They're like the new lawyers, the new, the new venerated people. But these are so powerful and so important that we need to demystify them and put them under human governance and human control. Uh, we need to bring in all these disciplines into that research area so that we make sure that our future, which involves all this whizzy science, AI, algorithm design, is something that doesn't just travel off into intellectual space and leave the rest of humanity wondering what's hit them. Uh, this is a pro two projects I'm working on at the moment, Carbon to Clean. This is basically a due diligence research platform for sustainable investment in, pre in clean tech. So we basically need to create um, a, a platform that allows people to investigate the science of, let's say, a new battery design or a new wind farm, uh, also the financial investment aspects, and make rational decisions about what to invest. The reason I like this project is it's got a nice business model. It's like people want to invest, they want to make good investment decisions, and yet all the science can be published purely open. Right? So we can get investment on this, we can build a platform, and yet everything we do is purely open for sustainability for the environment. Um, yeah. This is the uh, so there's a board of rich people who've got some money who want to put in put their investment into. And this is an early stage project. There will be other projects out there, and again, teamwork is what this is about. Um, I, I've got some software that I could show in terms of the publishing stuff, but I think I'm out of time. Yeah, yeah. yeah. So I'm not going to do that. The second thing, I, the last thing I want to say is that the other project we're working on is two um, uh, academic conferences. So one on e economics and anthropology, January 2019. And we want to organize. Um, a decentralized conference happening at different locations. So we've got three universities at the moment in three continents, also involving a civil society, and we want to publish that in as robust way as possible. So we don't want to do another World Social Forum Occupy type action. We want to combine the social conversation with robust new form of academic publishing using these techniques. So I'm really hoping to join up or link up with people working on static site uh, generation, uh, uh, content addressable links, uh, blockchain based provenance in a new form of journal and exploring different forms of peer review in that area. Um, uh, and really try and get the word out there by working together to do a conference. And that conference would be jointly owned by all the participants. So the governance of that conference is important. It, it, it's not my conference, it's not this university's conference. It's a decentralized, globally governed conference where we use the decentralized tools and, and work together to publish it in an annual experiment. So we're working on one of that in environmental science, which will be in two years, 18 months time. And January 2019, we're working on one in economics and politics, which we're calling Davos, which is basically going to be a fringe uh, uh, event to Davos in Switzerland. Davos in Portuguese means to give voice. So we're working with Democracy Earth Foundation, we're working with uh, University of Sao Paulo, um, uh, London Metropolitan University in um, uh, London, and a couple of um, somewhere in Africa, which isn't confirmed yet. In fact, London Met isn't properly confirmed yet. They just said, yeah, yeah, we'll definitely do it, but nothing signed yet. And we want to invite people and universities to self organize their own events and publish in a new way. And I think it's only by coming together and working together to do something together that we will address these interdisciplinary problems.
can show the software maybe tomorrow. Yeah, yeah. That would be a good opportunity, yeah? And um, I, I have something to ask so, uh, or to like mention. So I really like your uh, like view at these things and I sum summarize it in a way that you are saying that things that we are solving with blockchain today or like try to incorporate in this blockchain for science platforms have been there before, like challenges before, like reputation and continuous publication, but with trusted third parties, right? So the problem in the past was that we had to trust traditionally trusted third parties like ResearchGate or publisher platform uh, with these reputation systems, right? Not really. And, uh, uh, no? We had news now. Okay, okay, yeah. So for instance, when I was working with um, uh, John Donasso, working, we, we can work together because he had VC investment from Hamburg, so we can, uh, we were open source. But he wanted to publish all the signed, digital signed uh, votes to different Usenet channels. If you do that to enough people, it's effectively like publishing to the blockchain. It's, it's impossible to control Usenet channels. So uh, blockchain is amazing, and, uh, but its main amazingness is that it hypnotizes everyone with technology and money so people have ended up moving towards what they should have done years ago in any case. It also does provide not just the incentives and the magic, it does provide the most trusted, trustless infrastructure that you can leverage a whole lot of other interesting stuff on top of. So it's not bullshit, it's really interesting, important technology. But the fact is we could have done most of what we need to do in science publishing without blockchain years ago. Excellent. Yeah. It's the political will, though, isn't it? Yes. Yes. So it's. Hi. Uh, so I have a question um, about the social conversation that you were mentioning. Yes. Uh, it's kind of interesting because um, you were talking about how artists uh, like to share more information than scientists do. Yeah. And I think that's quite interesting because if you go to a platform like say YouTube, yeah. uh, people are just trying their best to share as much as content as possible and they're incentivized to do it. So, do you think that there is a halfway point where you can, uh, what do you think is missing in science as an incentive that is present in all these art platforms or sharing platforms? Because science is as much a creative process as any of these. So, do you think there is something there? The main thing is the pressure on scientists uh, to, to publish first original work and the, the different metrics that have been increasingly applied to that. So. Science, like the BBC, used to be a, basically a paternalistic institution. You'd find someone good, give them a space, and leave them to do whatever they were going to do. And, and they could then follow their own. But with the increasing management engineering of science and metrics, just like what happened to the BBC, so people came in with audience research and, 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 and a lot of monitoring of what was happening, this basically meant that you might want to collaborate with this person from an intellectual purpose, but you would then wouldn't get your paper out, so you would do this. So the main problem is the, the structure of the scientific institutions and the incentive uh, systems in place. And what's great about blockchain in this space is we have complete scope to re-engineer that. And what I think would be great is if we create a new new economic model for scientific publishing, I think that's what everyone here is talking about, and we look at how libraries can be involved in that, we look at doing it at plus minus zero profit sort of uh, uh, basis, and we make sure that we motivate and incentivize what scientists want to do. If they want to work with someone who's in a different department or a different part of the world, then we need to get not just the publishing industry out of the way, we need to get the university uh, incentives out of the way, saying, only here, please. Right? You know? um, and there are various other ones. And we need to look at that. And I think one of the core bodies to involve there are the scientific institutions. These people are responsible for governing the structure of science. And in my opinion, they're completely negligent. Uh, I, it's obvious you've been thinking about this for a long time, so it's uh, cool that decentralization was already a uh, movement before blockchain came around, and you explained that very well. Um, so I was, you also did a good job of demystifying algorithms a little bit, at least for me, so you can feel good about that. But, um, something I've encountered in, uh, I guess, like the state of the research around crypto right now is that algorithms that people are coming up with on governance they're kind of rudimentary. Uh, that might not be the right word for it, but like Bitcoin, Ethereum, 
they're worried about the economics and just the computer science of the protocol. And a lot of people are trying to steer these projects in the direction of making the governance model more modular, yep. depend on different schools of thought and just different inputs yep. before they make decisions. So um, has there been any kind of movements that you've seen towards like a multidisciplinary um, governance model that can kind of work together all on one standard and then kind of crowdsource an algorithm instead of one person getting all the credit for it? I, I, like you, I've been looking for that and trying to find people. So, I mean, the, the, the core project that I'm actually working on is called Platform.Earth, and it was about creating a, a containerized, dockerized legal governance platform for the commons. So, we're using, we're building on a project called OneClick.org, which has real legal governance for co ops and voluntary, not for profit associations and what have you, and adding that to the blockchain. But the idea is not to come up with what a lot of startups will be invest, interested in is like a specific algorithm, because that's where the money is. We own that, we can patent it, we can copyright it, we can do this, and we can offer sure. tokens on it. But to say this is just minimal, and within that you can add all sorts of uh, algorithms and governance structure. You can fork it, you can run your own, right? In scientific publishing, so we want to put an academic journal at the heart of this governance, and we want to say that's how the, 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 the journal is governed, right? This is how the money is transparent, this is how the incentives are. But people can then drag and drop metaphorically speaking, their own peer review algorithms onto that. And that then you can have a flourishing of experimentation. Some will produce good stuff and some won't. You can do longitudinal studies of this. We can actually do real science about science. Think of that. That would be amazing, wouldn't it? So instead of saying you're kind of creating a baseline, just to start. Yeah, minimal viable, minimal viable governance as well. And uh, the other term that I, I like to use, uh, um, publish, I don't like publishing stuff, is um, uh, common law algorithms. So uh, the design of an algorithm based on multi-stakeholder meetings uh, using good facilitation, writing, exploration of it, then coming up with a functional spe specification of what the algorithm should achieve, and then designing it. Not people, the, the, the clever mathematicians and coders and the business people coming up with an algorithm designed for their own particular worldview and economic interests, and then say, everyone use this, it's great. Yeah. So common law algorithms. And please, if you've got any desire to collaborate, talk to each other, come and talk to me. Let's do something together. Yeah, you build your open science ecosystem. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> okay, thank you very much. That was really cool. So, Ingo, if you want to go next? Yeah. Is it on Dropbox? Yeah, on Dropbox. Okay. Hello. Okay, so, hi everyone, I'm Ingo Keck from Moringa Science Publishing. And I'm also one of the old people I realized because I was very active in using it. And I have a similar idea and intention like David, but I decided to go another route. So I, want, I was very active in the open data space and in the early open science space, even though I didn't know it's called, it was called open science. And I thought we need to do something, we need to change the way how these things work. And instead of going down the route to develop a platform or think more and deep about it scientifically, I decided no, I need to. Uh, okay, I need to go back a little bit more. I was presenting a project at like a conference of publishers, of very advanced publishers, in Germany, and I've seen other publishers, and I realized it's not going to happen anything fundamentally new with these publishers. They are very well set in their roles. It's just not going to happen. We need to create our own publisher. And this is why I found it with two other friends from Ringer. And what I want to talk about now is why we need open science and why we need the blockchain for open science to actually work. Uh, I think it has been mentioned many times we are in a disability crisis. One example, only roughly 50% a uh, set of 59 papers that were important in economics could be reproduced with the same data and help 
from the alphas, which for me is completely crazy. I mean, you take the same data these people had, you use the same analysis that these people had, and they help you to do it correctly, and you don't get the same result they publish. That's something that should never happen, that should ne have never happened. It's even worse in preclinical cancer research, only 11.5% out of 53 landmark studies could be replicated, which obviously means that quite a bit of the cancer treatment we have is based on results that are not real results. They may be noise or something else, I don't know. But this might explain why we still not, are not able to treat cancer the way we maybe should be able to treat it. And I was working long time in neuroscience, and it's an open truth that the media statistics the power is only 18%. So a good friend of mine always used to say, fMRI research, uh, and like 90% is greatly over-exaggerated, completely noise, 5% you can trust more or less, and the other 5% you can really work with. It. And that's not just based in these uh, topics like neuroscience, etc. That's all around the world in, in science, in science world, like chemistry, biology, physics, medicine, <coughs> earth environment, other. It's very common that you're not able to reproduce a result. And there's nothing wrong with it. Maybe you have some external influence that changed your experiment. That's something to find out what's happening. So, if you're not able to reproduce the result, there's something going on that's worth investigating. And if you're able to reproduce the result, that's great. Then send it out and get other people to try to reproduce it. That's an important part of science. And actually, when I was supervising students, the first thing I put my students up if they started in a topic was to reproduce some result someone else has published. And that, if they manage to reproduce it, it's great. If, if not, we can look why not. The main point was they get a feeling for the topic they need to work on. And the second main point is actually that very important for science to be able to state we reproduce that result or we were not able to reproduce it. And this is fundamental part of science that up till now is very, very complicated, it's almost impossible to publish. And that should not be. There should be a space in scientific publishing where I can publish Reproductions. So the question is what's happening here. And I'll tell you a about, more about science as a system. So not, not the abstract science that we usually say, okay, science is you create a hypothesis. You look at the, the mountain of knowledge that has been created before you, you extract some hypothesis, then you test the top hypothesis, and then you say, okay, it worked out, it didn't work out, you adapt it. Hypothesis. That's not how it's done in the real world. In the real world, it looks more like this. You have the university or some funder who gives money to some big professor. This big professor gives space and money to something we used to call a brain on a stick. That is a PhD student, for example, or postdoc. And this postdoc or PhD student then creates an experiment with the help of this big professor, tests hypothesis. Validates the hypothesis, of course, all this costs a little bit of money. And as that costs money, there are big incentives to speed up that project, uh, that process very, very fast. And you start with an experiment where you can be sure that it's going to work out. You create a hypothesis that you're sure it's going to work out, and validation should be easy. Even though we do it this way, I would say that 90% of the results fail. You get many negative results. And that's great, that's cool, that's information. You learn something from negative results. But the problem is you cannot publish negative results, you can only publish positive results. So 90% of, of research is wasted for the rest of the world apart from your department. Your department knows that one didn't work out. But the rest of the world doesn't know that. So experiments are repeated around the world where you already know they're not going to work out. <laughs> Why? That's based of, of, of stuff, I mean, of, of research. Then important thing to publish it, because publish it, publication gives the 
highly evaluated token input factor back to the big professor who needs to report the input factor back to the university because university funding depends on the input factor. So that's the real world, as, as le at least in my impression working at Julia for 15 years. And one problem you have here is hacking. Scientists are naturally born hackers. So my rules for system security, I also work as as consultant for that, is everything that can be hacked gets hacked. All man-made systems can be hacked somewhere. Scientists are naturally born hackers because we hack nature, we want to find out how nature is working. Okay? So we need to hack nature. We are born that way. And if you want to make a system uh, proof prone against hacking, you need to embrace the hackers. But that's genius level. I mean, Bitcoin managed that. Bitcoin is set up in a way that like if you find a way how to hack Bitcoin, you actually use that way to make Bitcoin stronger because you make money out of it, you make Bitcoins out of it. When they realized how to do the, the mining, the hashing, instead of a computer on a CPU on a, on a GPU, they didn't use it to attack the Bitcoin network. No, they used it to mine faster, to mine more Bitcoins because they make money out of it. That's what I say, that's, that's the genius level, that's embracing the hackers. So if you look back at that system of science, there are obviously a lot of places where we can hack stuff. I don't, be, I don't think that's complete, there are maybe more ways, but that's the most obvious ones. So you can hack your experiments into some biased selection of results. No one is going to notice because you are the one who does the kind of stuff. Hypothesis, you do some biased reasoning and try to get that through with the refuse you know well. Uh, validation, p-value hacking. And when it goes to publishing, you suppress your negative results. It's easy because you cannot publish them anyway, so you only write in the positive results in your result. Publication, yeah, shaky refuse. I send that to some editor and say, hey, editor, uh, a good friend of me, Cookie Blues, sent that to the following refuse, which also good friend of me. Okay, and then it goes through. Citation hacking. Years ago, uh, especially in medicine, people started to hack citations. Just add lots of citations to your article. So the level of impact factor for all medical journals was rising, rising up, and now we are in a situation where I think the New England Journal of Medicine has an impact factor of 73 or 78, something. It's crazy. I mean, that's totally crazy. And that's uh, uh, overall citation hacking that's going on. And I don't believe that we should put the blame on the people who do that hacking. The problem is that impact factor is completely bullshit to use. Okay? Just forget it. It may be a good idea to select where, uh, why it's been created initially, to select which sub subscription to hold in the library, okay? But it's completely bullshit to use impact factor to classify a researcher or research project. So, what can we do? What can we do to change it? So, our idea is to avoid that experiment selective bias, use open science, open up your experiment, open up your reasoning, why did you do the experiment this way? It doesn't need to be perfect, but more transparency is going to help. Hypothesis, create an open discussion, so people can say, no, I don't think that's the right way, or it's a good idea, but maybe do it this way, and then discuss why you have the hypothesis this way. And if people have a different hypothesis, they can take it and run with it. I think that's what you said. Be open to the forking, okay? I have an idea, you can have a different idea. Maybe yours better. This is, we don't know, this is science, okay? Our, our, the reason why we do science <coughs> is to create knowledge. And as long as there's an attribution, because I want people to know that I was the first one who came up with the idea and someone else took it and, and changed it, but there's still part of my idea in it, Fine for me. Validation. If we can publish repetitions, 
we can make sure that an experiment that worked out a thousand times worldwide is known to be very valid. Well, if we can publish that it didn't work out 999 times, we know it's probably some noise effect or something. It also means we need to be able to publish negative results, obviously. If I try something and it doesn't work out, I should publish it. And maybe someone else here says, okay, I know Ingo is stupid. He did that mistake here. I, I believe if I change that, it's going to work. It's great. Take my negative result, run with it. If it works out, great. If it doesn't work out, another thing that we learned. In this way, we can, can publish probably like 90% of science, which is right now something like the dark matter of science. It's there, but no one can see it. We can bring it to the light and people can work with it. Publication to work against shady refuse, we need open refuse. Obviously, if someone doesn't like me and writes some bad refuse, he can still do it, but at least his name will be on there. And other people will read it and say, okay, why, why did you say that? So it's his or her reputation that's going to be in danger if we open up the refuse. And obviously, we need to get away with that input factor. You know, that's something that open science is not going to do because we are not in the position to do it. That institutionalized impact factor is something that universities have to take away, have to delete. Because that's impact factor, just basic. So, so we, we found the publisher, we said, OK, what can we do on the publisher side? What we can do is actually create space for all these, these places like open science, open discussion, repetition, energy precise, open workplace. So we sat down and said, let's make a lot of mega channels. Maybe a little bit crazy, but we just had the idea. And we had one mega channel for open science where we say all areas of research are welcome. The only thing that we ask you is follow the scientific method, open up your data because it's open science, open up your analysis scripts, open up your results, okay? And then you can send it to us and get it published. Next one is, we said, said we want to have a venue for discussions. So we create a channel for, for open discussion. And we're also uh, evolving around the way. So right now we have two submissions, submissions in, in uh, this thing cloud channel, and turned out that our edition initial idea how to do it is not really adequate. So first we said, thought we make first the refuse process and then publication, open access and publish the refuse. Now we realize, no, it's not going to work out. It's very complicated to refuse these kind of articles. If someone proposes a new idea that's a combination of three different subjects, it's very, very hard to find a refuse that has the same knowledge. And I thought initially it's not going to be complicated to just take two different reviewers and they review one part. But the reference actually said, no, we don't want to do that. So we now switch in here to an uh, open publication process. So first publish and then do the peer review process afterwards. And I personally would be fine with some very open peer review, or maybe not a review, more like a, a commenting think, but here we have the problem that many universities only pay the publishing fee if it's a um, peer review channel. So we need to have the peer review still there. We have one for experimental petitions where you can publish something, and this is an example where we expect lots of small stuff, like saying, I repeated that just like it's written in the article, it worked or it didn't work. If it didn't work, probably you try out new stuff. We have one for negative <coughs> results, especially. And the other thing, if you look at stuff that's actually used in the real world, look at Bitcoin. What's the fundamental publication of Bitcoin? It's a white paper. It has never been officially published. It's on a web page. Maybe if that web page goes down tomorrow, what's going to happen? So we want to have a channel where you can send in your white papers, your small medical studies that you don't get published somewhere else, your technical reports, etc., your master thesis if you want, and we can get published here. No peer review because it's not a good idea to have a peer review of a white paper. 
only the interior if you if your white paper is actually comp complete. I mean, I was looking at some white papers in the blockchain domain, and they were like only written to the half, and then say, like, okay, to be done, to be done. You know, we're going to publish that, but as long as it's complete, we're going to publish it. And we want to. The idea here is to save that information for future researchers. We still have a problem, though. So we could be traditional publisher. We publish on our web page. We publish in paper. And then our web page goes down. And the good thing is we have open access, so everyone can take a copy and put the copy online. But how do people find that copy? It's not easy. It should be much easier. So who guarantees that articles and data are persistently available? And the next thing is who guarantees that that stuff is actually authentic? Well, you can trust us but maybe you trust more the original author. And if the original author can sign his work, put the hash on some blockchain, much better. And the interesting thing when I looked around is that there's actually no guarantees by established publisher how long the stuff is online. I can pay a few thousand euros to Elsevier, and Elsevier doesn't promise me availability online for even a year or something. Why? I mean, it's crazy. It's not, not costing that amount of money to do that. And the other thing I realized while I was uh, with the Open Origin Island is like 80% of all scientific data is lost three years after publication or after finishing the project. And the funny thing is the same happens to grey literature. So 80% of the grey literature that's put on the web page of some university or something is lost after just three years. And but it's not something that should happen. So we can use blockchain. I don't need to say, tell you what a blockchain is. We use blockchain for authenticity. If you publish with us, we put the hash of the article of the data on a blockchain. Everyone can follow the blockchain, so you know what has been published with us. Everyone can check if it's really the same article. And if it's signed by the author, everyone can check that the author is actually the correct author. And the next level would be to have the reviews also on a blockchain system. And to have availability, we thought about using IPFS. So the idea is, the nice thing about IPFS, I don't know if you, you probably have heard about IPFS. The nice thing about IPFS is if I put a document out on IPFS, it's available to everyone using IPFS. If someone else in the world, maybe in Africa, downloads a copy of that document to his IPFS node, we now have two copies. If my copy goes down, my note goes down, he's going to serve it. If 1,000 people read the article on IPFS, we have 1,000 copies of IPFS of the whole world. So that's really cool. That makes data really, really safe in the network. And this is why we uh, decided to use IPFS to store that stuff. And the next thing about interesting about IPFS is the, the content-based uh, reference system. So if I prefer <coughs> a data set that's stored in IPFS, I'm just using the hash of the data set. So I can be sure five years later, if I download the data set with that hash from IPFS, I'm getting the same data set that was published five years ago. That's great, that's cool stuff. And yeah, that's more or less what I wanted to tell you. Reason why open science is important, why open science is the way to go, in my opinion, in science, and why we actually need distributed systems like IPFS and blockchain to solve the problems that are involved here. Yeah. Thank you. Another thing I want to say, if anyone wants to publish with us, I'm here <laughs> to play tomorrow. We're looking for editors, reviewers, authors more than anything today. It would be great. Yeah? What, um, can you give uh, an example of the sorts of subjects and things that you uh, are publishing or are looking to publish? The idea is to have a journal for everything. Okay. So it's a mega journal. Yeah. Why, sh why should I, now I guess, when I can do an easy search, separate 
subjects into journals. So right now I think, you know, we can put everything into one channel. I, actually, I don't really think we need journals. We could put everything together and just search on it, but for us it was easier to use an existing software, the open journal system, and there I have to work with journals, so we work with this way. Yes. So uh, open science has been around for quite a while, the idea. Um, in your opinion, what's like the most important thing that keeps everyone from doing open science? Clear answer, the institutional pressure, like the incentives. I tried to be a professor, didn't work out. Why? Because I didn't play the game of the impact factor. So I wanted to, to, to teach students, I wanted to gain knowledge and give that knowledge away to other people and, and that's not how it works. If you want to be, if you want to grow in the academic system, you have to follow the rules of that system and that the rules of